You can be seated. Open up this evening to Numbers. Numbers 29. We're going to get there in a few minutes. Um, the Jewish religious calendar begins with Nisan, or March slash April, because remember, the Israelite calendar runs on a lunar solar year, so they have a leap month every few years, so it's kind of a confusing thing, but in the month Nisan, or Nisan, there are three feasts that begin in three days, and we talked about these. We have the Feast of Passover. Passover starts the evening of Nisan 14. Then we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, starts the very next morning, Nisan 15. Then we have the Feast of First Fruits that begins on Nisan 16. Following that, we have 50 days. 50 days pass until the Feast of Pentecost. It also goes by the name the Feast of Weeks. And this is the feast that celebrates the end of the wheat harvest. So the Feast of First Fruits celebrates the beginning of the barley harvest. It's when they take the barley and it's waved before the Lord by the priest. The Feast of Pentecost, or weeks, is the end of the wheat harvest. After the Feast of Pentecost, there is a long break in the calendar of feasts. Kind of like how it is after you hit uh, July 4th. There's not really a whole lot for some months then. And so we come here this evening to a different uh, feast, but... Before we get there, I mentioned to you last week that some people have likened that pause that, that happens after the Feast of Pentecost to the period in which we now find ourselves, the church age. The parallel is strengthened by the fact that the next feast on the calendar, the feast that breaks the silence, is the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of the, the sound that is going to end the church age is going to be the sound of the trumpet. So there is a parallel there, but we don't need to make more of it than God does. We're going to talk this evening about the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. If you'd like, you're turned to Numbers 29. If you'd like, you can hold a finger there and you can look at Leviticus 23. I'm just going to read that to you and then we'll go to Numbers in just a moment. But Leviticus 23, 23 says this. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing trumpets, and holy convocation. Remember, convocation really just means a gathering together. You're going to have a time. When you get everybody together, this is not one of the feasts when all of the men had to go up to Jerusalem. This is just a time when all the people who live near you, so think your, your family, they lived in fairly close-knit family communities. Everybody in your area, you're going to get together for this holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, if you have that little chart that I gave you, the Feast of Trumpets begins on the first day of the seventh month. The seventh month of the Jewish calendar is called Tishri. Tishri. The first day of this month is called Rosh Hashanah. Have you heard that? You're familiar with that. We don't, they don't call it the, the, the Feast of Trumpets as much, but we hear about Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah means head of the year. And it, it has the idea of the first of the year. To which you have maybe the same question that I have. I thought Passover was the first of the year. Because we talked about that. He says back in, in Leviticus 23 that this will be the beginning of the year. He says that in Exodus as well. <clears throat> so what's, what does he mean? Well, this is the beginning of the Jewish civil calendar. So they have multiple different new years here. Nisan, the month of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, is the beginning of the Jewish religious calendar. And then we come to the seventh month, which is the beginning of the Jewish civil calendar. So think almost the same idea like a fiscal year. That, that idea. They don't run on the calendars the same way that we do. Rosh Hashanah spans two days because traditionally... There 
was difficulty in specifying exactly when a new moon started because there was a time when, when you looked up, if it happened to be cloudy that night, you couldn't be exactly sure. They would sometimes get their calendars a little bit. So there, it's celebrated primarily on Tishri, one, the first, and the second. Yes, Is there other countries and peoples that have their own calendar also? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a Chinese New Year, there's a Korean New Year, all sorts of Brazil. Not January 1st. Not January 1st. Everybody's got their own. Yep. No wonder everybody don't mess up. <laughs> <laughs> they should come to America yeah, and they can get it right. Get it right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This correspond the, the month Tishri corresponds to our September, October. This past year, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, happened on September 15th to September 17th. So that's, we've just come past it here. It was the middle of last month, almost exactly a month ago. But let's talk about the trumpets a little bit because this is not part of our culture. The trumpets, there are two types of trumpets that were used in Jewish daily life. The one is called a shofar. You're familiar with this one. A shofar would be a hollowed out ram's horn. And sometimes a shofar could be this long, Usually it has a curve in it, but a shofar could also be four or five feet long. Just depends on the size of the ram you got. But when we were over uh, in Israel, you see in, in markets and stuff, they sell shofars all the time. Uh, it's a big item for tourists to come and take home. I have one somewhere, but I've misplaced my shofar. The one I have is about that long. I got it back years and years ago from my grandfather. But the shofar is the one. That's probably the most common. Most, uh, it wasn't hard to lay hands on a shofar, and most villages would have a shofar. But there is also, in Numbers chapter 10, verses 1 to 10, there is some talk of some silver trumpets. These were special. These were silver trumpets that were made for the express purpose when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, when they had the tabernacle and they were traveling around, these trumpets, there were two silver trumpets. And the code, the trumpet code, if you want to call that, is laid out in Numbers 10. One blow on the trumpet, on one blow on one trumpet means just the leaders of the tribe are supposed to assemble at the tabernacle. If there is several blasts on both trumpets, that means that Everybody is supposed to come. And there were, there were different codes, kind of like the noon whistle, different codes that people knew. If this is what it sounds like, this is what we do. They're used for signals and calling of individuals. And again, each group, each tribe had its own blast. So in, if you want to bring just the tribe of Judah, then you blow the tribe of Judah's horn blast, and they will come. Numbers chapter 10, let me give you... Verse 10, it's the last day of that. It says, also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days, and in the beginning of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpets, these are the silver trumpets, over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God, for I am the Lord your God. So every month they would have the new month is brought in by the horn blast. And everybody knows <laughs> this is what this blast is, is supposed to be telling. Every month begins with this. So, so it's not unusual for people to hear the blowing of a trumpet. But this day is a little bit different. On the day of the Feast of Trumpets, the trumpets would sound at least 100 times. Mm -hmm. So we're talking lots of blasts on the trumpet. Numbers 29, verse 1 says, And in the seventh month, and on the first day of the month, ye shall have an holy convocation, ye shall do no servile work. It is the day of the blowing of trumpets. That blowing of trumpets is the Hebrew word that means making of noise. <laughs> means you're, you're going to get together on this day, and you're going to make a lot of racket, which is what they did. Leviticus 23, verse 24. Ye shall... Ye shall Ye shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So this is another one of these high Sabbath, 
possibilities. Remember what a high Sabbath is? A high Sabbath is when the feast day falls on a day other than Saturday. So if you have a, if, if the Feast of Trumpets falls on a Friday, then you have the High Sabbath, and then you have the regular Sabbath, and then you just go on about your business. The, the thing is, with this particular holiday, it's a little bit different. If the Feast of Trumpets happened to fall on a Saturday, that would make it not a high Sabbath, it's just a, a special Sabbath, because it's the, the Sabbath plus. <laughs> but they couldn't blow the trumpets if it fell on a Saturday. Can you guess why they couldn't blow the trumpets if it fell on a Saturday? Because it's work. Because the tradition said, if you pick up the shofar, you're working. So if it fell on a Saturday on the Sabbath, they would wait, and they would blow the trumpets on the next day. Because, again, this is what happens when man gets his tradition super involved in what God has said. Man always makes things more complicated. Remember, the Jewish religious system took the five books of Moses and turned it into the 12 books of the Mishnah. They overcomplicated everything they touched. So the trumpets are sounding. There's a lot of, of blasts on the trumpet. Again, at least 100. But let's talk here about the Sabbaths here for just a moment. By the way, we, we have the noon whistle that goes off here. The noon whistle goes off every day, and it's just kind of part of life, right? If you, if you live anywhere where you can hear it, I, I sometimes, if I'm usually, I'm getting lunch about that time. And if it goes off... Maybe I notice it, but it wouldn't be unusual for it to be 12.05 and me to say, did the whistle go off? Yeah, yeah. Because I don't even notice it anymore. But if the noon whistle went off a hundred times one day, it would be different. This is different. This would be a big deal to the, to the Jewish people. There's some sacrifices. Your turn to Numbers 29. Numbers 29. Here's verse 2. So, this day, this... High Sabbath, if it falls on a day other than Saturday, has the, not only the blowing of trumpets, but also some sacrifices. Verse 2, and ye shall offer a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto the Lord. Here's what you offer on this one day. One young bullock, one ram, and seven lambs of the first year without blemish. And their meat offering shall be of flour mingled with oil. Three tenths deals for a bullock. Two tenth deals for a ram, and one tenth deal for one lamb, throughout the seven lambs, and one kid of the goats for a sin offering, to make an atonement for you. Look at verse 6, the first phrase there, beside the burnt offering of the month, and his meat offering, and the daily burnt offering, and his meat offering, and their drink offerings, according to their manner, for a sweet sac savor, a sacrifice, made by fire unto the Lord. That, that phrase right there, verse 6, beside the burnt offering of the month. There were regular sacrifices that were made in the temple. The priest's job was never done. Again, and I've made the point many times, there were no chairs in the tabernacle or in the temple. The reason for this is because the priest always had something else to do. It also pictures that the, their job was never done. But Jesus, when he finished, he sat down at the right hand of God. Good picture but there was always something going on. There was a sacrifice at the beginning of the month, just like there was a horn blast at the beginning of the month. There was also a sacrifice in the morning, and then there was a sacrifice in the evening. Every day of the year, there is the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. So when you walk past the tabernacle, there's always smoke rising off of the altar because it's either the morning sacrifice or the evening sacrifice. When you get up in the morning and you're, you're walking through the camp, there's still the smoke from the evening sacrifice and they're getting ready to offer the morning sacrifice. There's always something going on. But on this day, they are offering in addition. In addition to the, the one that would be sacrificed in the morning and the monthly sacrifice, because this is the first day of the month, they're also offering a ram, a bull, seven lambs, and a kid of the goat. And the accompanying meat and drink offering. So for every, for every bull, there is a certain amount of flour 
that is to be offered. And flour and salt. Salt was to be included in all of the offerings. So they have the, the flour, and that's when it talks about the meat offering. It's talking about flour. And they would offer that, and there's a, there's a certain measurement that is offered for a bull, for a goat, for a lamb. And, and they have all of that laid out. And they begin into this, into this process. So what's the reason behind all of this? Why do we, why do we need to know this? <laughs> why does this matter? Well, the Jews, again, they're going about their routine lives, work for the kids, playing and schooling, domestic tasks, and so on. And it was roughly the same day after day, week after week. The Jewish people were just like us. They had a routine. You have a thing that you do on Thursdays. You say, well, it's a lot like what I do on Wednesdays. But that doesn't matter. It's, it's what you do. You have a routine, and they did as well. But when Tishri, the month Tishri arrives, and you come to Tishri the first, there's a startling call out of the habitual, the default that you've, that you've gone into. You, you have kind of your rut where you wake up and you're just doing stuff. And, and you could be on your second pot of coffee before you even realize that you're walking around the house because you're so used to doing it this particular way. But they had this, this sudden time. Again, if the noon whistle went off a hundred times, you'd think, this is weird. This is, this is different. And here, they, they're used to the sacrifices. They're used to the sound of a trumpet. But they're not used to this level. They're not used to this much noise, this much commotion. The Feast of Trumpets is the kickoff of something. The Feast of Trumpets, on the first day of Tishri, it starts. On this day, we start ten days. This feast, the Feast of Trumpets, begins the preparation that is going to culminate in the Day of Atonement. For ten days, the children of Israel are going to prepare themselves for the Day of Atonement. So the, the Feast of Trumpets is like you have, you have on your phone, you have reminders that go off. You have an alarm. This is their yearly alarm, and it goes off before the feast that is going to be the Day of Atonement. And, and the alarm says, hey, you need to get ready. You need to get ready for the day of atonement that is coming. So the, the question, the answer to the question, why do we need to know this? Because they're getting ready for something. This is the, this is the hey, heads up, you're only a week and a half away from the highest holy day of the Jewish calendar, which we'll talk about next time. Jewish tradition also says that the week of creation like the first week of creation, they would say that creation began on the month Elul, which is the sixth month. They say it began on Elul 25th, making the first day of Tishri the day that God created man. How accurate is that? <laughs> we don't know. Impossible to know. To the best of my knowledge, nowhere on planet Earth did God inscribe a date that said, you know, manufactured on this date. We don't have that there. Jewish tradition also takes special time to remember this, Tishri the first, as the day that Abraham would have sacrificed Isaac on Mount Moriah. So there's some significance there. The ten days between Rosh Hashanah the day of the Feast of Trumpets, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, those ten days are called the Days of Awe, or the Days of Repentance. Yom Kippur symbolizes the forgiveness of sin for all the people of Israel. It's the day when the priest, this is the one day a year, and we'll talk about this when we're together next time. This is the one day a year that the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. This is the one day a year that blood was applied to the mercy seat for the sins of the people. It's a big deal. And so they needed this time to prepare. Yom Kippur pictures forgiveness of sins. What has to happen before forgiveness of sins? If you want your sins forgiven, you have to confess. You have to confess. 
Repent would be the word that, that is used. 2 Peter 3, 9. We gave this Sunday. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7, 10. But godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Written to Christians, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I want forgiveness, I have to repent. I have to confess. If somebody wants to be saved, they have to repent. You, you can't have a savior from sin if you're happy in your sin, right? If, if I'm more than content to have cancer, I'm not going to seek treatment for cancer. You have to repent. You have to turn away and turn towards Christ. The Jews took this time, this 10 days, that is announced by the Feast of Trumpets, they took this 10-day period very seriously. There was a period of confession of sins to God. It's called, I'm probably butchering this, but it's called teshuva. The teshuva is specifically, it's my repentance towards God. There's a time of self-examination and soul-searching in order to confess all of my sins. This is called, again, cheshban Hanefesh. This is a time when I'm going to spend some time in prayer, in meditation, but not as the world meditates. I'm going to spend some time thinking, and I'm going to ask the Lord to lay on my heart anything that I need to confess. There's also a confession of sins to those who had personally been sinned against. So my neighbor, perhaps I've, I've done something against my neighbor. There's a period of, of confession there called Makila. And these are not just quaint Jewish traditions. This is important for us too. This confession, confession of my sins before God. If I'm going to receive forgiveness, again, if we confess, he's faithful and just to forgive. Meaning what? If we don't confess. And he can't forgive, right? He's no, Obviously, my sins in Christ are covered. But, but my fellowship, that's what we're talking about. My fellowship won't be restored. If I'm hard-nosed in my sin, then my fellowship with God is not going to be sweet. Luke 13, 3 and 5 both say, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Psalm 32, 5 says, I acknowledged my sin unto thee. Mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. It's always been how it's worked. Forgiveness is contingent upon repentance. Proverbs 28, verse 13. You're familiar with this verse. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. My confession before God is important. Searching ourselves, is that something that should be done? Should we spend time in, again, self-examination? And that's gotten a bad rap because of psychologists and all of the, the psychobabble that gets thrown around. I'm not talking about that. For me to sit quietly and say, Lord, you put your finger on any spot in my life that's not right. It's something that I'm overlooking, something that I'm glossing over. Psalm 51, 23, this was David after he sinned with Bathsheba, this is the end of the chapter. He says, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Would that be a good prayer for you and I to pray? For sure. For us to spend time. Lord, if there's <coughs> something in my life that's not right, put your finger on it. And Lord, if you, if you point it out, I'll get it right. Proverbs 17, 3, the finding pot is for silver, the furnace for gold, but the Lord trieth the hearts. Can God show you what's wrong? <coughs> he can, if you ask him, 
If you ask him, I've, I've talked with, with folks and I've done it myself. I, I highly recommend spending some time before the Lord saying, Lord, I'm just going to be quiet. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meditate on you. And if there's something in my life that's not right, you put your finger on it and I'll confess it. If you do that, I would recommend having some time on your hands because it's amazing how much stuff kind of piles up. My confession before God, my self-examination, and then getting right with other people who we've sinned against. That's just, a, that's just a Jewish thing for the Feast of Trumpets, right? No, that's for us too. Listen to Matthew 5, 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar... And there rememberest that thy brother hath fought against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be recompensed, or reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Does God want me to have a right relationship with him? For sure. Does God want me to have a right relationship with you? Also, for sure. The Jews also associated the sounding of a trumpet with the coronation of a king. And you can find that all throughout the Old Testament. When a king was coronated, they would blow trumpets. They still do that at the coronation of kings. And so it would be at this time also that the Jews would acknowledge God as the king of heaven, as they worshipped at the Feast of Trumpets. So the Feast of Trumpets, think of, think of the Feast of Trumpets as the alert. The alert on, the, on their phone, because they didn't have phones, they had trumpets. So they had the alert, and the alert says, you've got ten days. Ten days to, to confess. Confess before God. Spend some time. Get things right. Get things right with your neighbor. Because on the tenth day, Tishri the tenth, is the day of atonement. It's a big deal. That's the day for the forgiveness of sin. Now we could go deeper into Jewish tradition surrounding this feast. But there's one parallel that we should also point out. We started with it, but we want to just kind of come back and mention it. The trumpet would sound and a time of intense self-examination began in preparation for the Day of Atonement. As believers, we're also waiting on the sound of a trumpet. The difference is they knew if they looked at their calendar, they would know Tishri is coming up. The day of the Feast of Trumpets is almost here. We don't know. We don't know the day or the hour of the Lord's return. When the trumpet sounds, the trump of God that we're told about in 1 Thessalonians, when the trumpet sounds, we're going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And then we'll face the judgment seat of Christ, where at the judgment seat of Christ, it's not that we receive punishment. They're, they're, my sins have been punished. My sins were punished in Christ. So I'm not going to receive punishment. But at the, at the judgment seat of Christ, I receive rewards or I suffer loss is how Paul describes it. Meaning there will be things that I thought I did with the right motive, but I really did it for pride. I really, I, it wasn't, I wasn't doing it for God. So for those things that I thought I would get reward for, I won't. For the Jews, the trumpet was the indication for the beginning of preparation for a day of judgment. For Christians, for you and me, the trumpet, if it were to sound tonight, the trumpet indicates the end of our time of preparation. And then we stand in his presence. It's not, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be something? Could you imagine? Go with me here to a, another dimension. <laughs> imagine, if you will, that when the trumpet sounds, you've got ten days before we're called up together to meet the Lord. Boy, that, could you imagine those ten days? What, what would people do? How many people do you think would get right in ten days? Whew. I'll bet churches would Man, it, would be, it wouldn't be even standing room only. They'd be packed. Why? Well, because people would take it seriously. Because they'd say, well, I've only got 10 days. We don't know how long we have. We might have 10 days. We might have 10 years. The Lord might not come for another 100 years, but he also might come tomorrow. So what should we do? Well, we should live in light of the fact that, that we can stand before the judgment seat of Christ very soon. 1 Corinthians 15.34 says, Awake to righteousness and 
sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. <clears throat> we should be awake. You and I should be awake. We should be actively serving. We should keep short accounts with God. By short accounts, I mean this. When you do wrong, don't say, well, I'm going to let a few more add up before I spend time in prayer. No, go to the Lord now. Why? It's not, it's not so that you're saved. If you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, then again, your sin is dealt with, but your fellowship. I'm a limbo, and, and I have a relationship with my father. Is there anything that I can do to spoil that relationship? Yes. And if I do, then I should do what's necessary to restore that relationship. I need to keep short accounts with God. Because why? Because I don't know but what the trumpet might sound today, tomorrow. We should be aware, actively serving. Because when the trumpet sounds, we don't have ten days. When the trumpet sounds for us, time's up. No more. We won't need to pray anymore when the trumpet sounds. Because we'll be in his presence. We won't get to witness anymore. Because that's, we're in the presence of God. There's only Christians there. We won't get to serve anymore. So do it now.